Error Read Along. Today we're going to finish the end of chapter 18. There is an unexpected visitor. I think I mentioned yesterday that I knew a fortune teller was going to be visiting soon. And uh, the fortune teller visits at the end of this chapter. It's a good scene. It does continue into the next chapter. So the good part's next chapter, which will be Monday. But let's just dig in here to the end of 18. And thanks so much for joining me. I have not yet said anything condemnatory of Mr. Rochester's project of marrying for interest and connections. It surprised me when I first discovered that such was his intention. I had thought him a man unlikely to be influenced by his motives, by motives so commonplace in his choice of a wife. But the longer I considered the position, education, etc., of the parties, the less I felt justified in judging and blaming either him or Miss Ingram for acting in conformity to ideas and principles instilled into them, doubtless, from their childhood. All their class held these principles. I suppose, then, they had reasons for holding them such as I could not fathom. It seemed to me that, were I a gentleman like him, I would take to my bosom only such a wife as I could love. But the very obviousness of the advantages to the husband's own happiness offered by this plan convinced me that there must be arguments against its general adoption of which I was quite ignorant. Otherwise, I felt sure all the world would act as I wished to act. But in other points, as well as this, I was growing very lenient to my master. I was forgetting all his faults, for which I had once kept a sharp lookout. It had fortunately been my endeavor, it had formerly been my endeavor to study all sides of his character, to take the bad with the good, and from the just weighing of both to form an equitable judgment. Now I saw no bad. The sarcasm that had repelled, the harshness that had startled me once, were only like keen condiments on a choice dish. Their presence was pungent, but their absence would be felt as comparatively insipid. And as for the vague something, was it a sinister or a sorrowful, or a designing or a desponding expression? That opened upon a careful observer now and then in his eye, and closed again before one could fathom the strange depth partially disclosed. That something which used to make me fear and shrink, as if I had been wandering amongst volcanic-looking hills and had suddenly felt the ground quiver and seen it gape. That something I, at intervals, beheld still, and with throbbing heart, but not with palsied nerves. Instead of wishing to shun, I longed only to dare, to divine it, and I thought Miss Ingram happy, because one day she might look into the abyss at her leisure, explore its secrets, and analyze their nature. Meantime, while I thought only of my master and his future bride, saw only them, heard only their discourse, and considered only their movements of importance, the rest of the party were occupied with their own separate interests and pleasures. The ladies, Ling, the ladies Lynn and Ingram continued to consort in solemn conferences, where they nodded their two turbans together at each other and held up their four hands in confronting gestures of surprise or mystery or horror according to the theme on which their gossip ran, like a pair of magnified puppets. Mild Miss Dent talked with good-natured Miss Ashton, and the two sometimes bestowed a courteous word or smile on me. Mr. George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and Mr. Ashton discussed politics or county affairs or justice business. Lord Ingram flirted with Amy Ashton. Louisa played and sang, too, and with one of the Mr.'s Lynn. And Lady and Mary Ingram listened languidly to the gallant speeches of the other. Sometimes all, as with one consent, suspended their byplay to observe and listen to the principal actors. For, after all, Mr. Rochester and, because closely connected with him, Miss Ingram, were the life and soul of the party. If he was absent from the room an hour, a perceptible dullness seemed to steal over the spirits of his guests and his re-entrance was sure to give a fresh impulse to the vivacity of conversation. The want of his animating influence appeared to be peculiarly felt one day that he had been summoned to Millcote on business and was not likely to return till late. The afternoon was wet. A walk the party had proposed to take to see a gypsy camp, lately pitched on a common beyond hay, was consequently deferred. Some of the gentlemen were gone to the stables, the younger ones, together with the younger ladies, were playing billiards in the billiard room. 
The dowagers Ingram and Lynn sought solace in a quiet game at cards. Blanche Ingram, after having repelled by supercilious taciturnity, some efforts of Mrs. Dent and Mrs. Ashton to draw her into conversation, had first murmured over some sentimental tunes and airs on the piano, and then, having fetched a novel from the library, had flung herself in haughty listlessness on the sofa, and prepared to beguile, by the spell of fiction, the tedious hours of absence. The room and the house were silent, only now and then the merriment of the billiard players was heard from above. It was verging on dusk, and the clock had already given warning of the hour to dress for dinner, when little Adele, who knelt by me in the drawing room window seat, suddenly exclaimed, Voila, Monsieur Rochester has returned. I turned, and Miss Ingram darted forwards from the sofa. The others, too, looked up from their several occupations, for at the same time a crunching of wheels and a splashing tramp of horse hooves became audible on the wet gravel a post-chaise was approaching. "'What can possess him to come home in that style?' said Miss Ingram. "'He rode his horse, did he not, when he went out, and Pilot was with him. What has he done with the animals?' As she said this, she approached her tall person and ample garments so near the window that I was obliged to bend back almost to the breaking of my spine. In her eagerness, she did not observe me at first, but when she did, she curled her lip and moved to another casement. The post-chaise stopped, the driver rang the doorbell, and a gentleman alighted, attired in traveling garb. But it was not Mr. Rochester. It was a tall, fashionable-looking man, a stranger. How provoking, exclaimed Miss Ingram, you tiresome monkey, she said to Adele, who perched you up in the window to give false intelligence? And she cast on me an angry glance, as if it was my fault. Some parleying was audible in the hall, and soon the newcomer entered. He bowed to Lady Ingram, as deeming her the eldest lady in present. "'It appears I come at an inopportune time, madame,' said he, "'when my friend Mr. Rochester is from home. But I arrive from a very long journey, and I think I may presume so far on old and intimate acquaintance as to install myself here until he returns.' His manner was polite, his accent, in speaking, struck me as being somewhat unusual, not precisely foreign, but still not altogether English. His age might be about Mr. Rochester's, between 30 and 40. His complexion was singularly sallow. Otherwise, he was a fine-looking man, at first sight especially. On closer examination, you detected something in his face that displeased, or rather that failed to please. His features were regular, but too relaxed. His eye was large and well-cut, but the life looking out of it was a tame, vacant life, at least so I thought. The sound of the dressing bell dispersed the party. It was not till after a dinner that I saw him again. He then seemed quite at ease, but I liked his physiognomy even less than before. It struck me as being at the same time unsettled and inanimate. His eye wandered and had no meaning in its wandering. This gave him an odd look, such as I never remembered to have seen. For a handsome and not an unamiable looking man, he repelled me exceedingly. There was no power in that smooth skinned face of a full oval shape, no firmness in that aquiline nose and small cherry mouth. There was no thought on the low, even forehead, no command in that blank brown eye. As I sat in my usual nook and looked at him with the light of the girandoles on the mantelpiece beaming full over him, for he occupied an armchair drawn close to the fire, and kept shrinking still nearer, as if he were cold, I compared him with Mr. Rochester. I think, with deference be it spoken, the contrast could not be much greater than between a sleek gander and a fierce falcon, between a meek sheep and the rough-coated, keen-eyed dog, its guardian. He had spoken of Mr. Rochester as an old friend. A curious friendship there must have been, a pointed illustration indeed, of the old adages that extremes meet. Two or three of the gentlemen sat near him, and I caught at times scraps of their conversation across the room. At first I could not make much sense of what I heard, for the discourse of Louisa Eshton and Mary Ingram, who sat nearer to me, confused the fragmentary sentences that reached me at intervals. The last were discussing the stranger. They both called him a beautiful man. Louisa said he was a love of a creature, and she adored him and Mary instanced his pretty little mouth and nice nose, 
as her ideal of the charming. And what a sweet-tempered forehead he has, cried Louisa, so smooth, none of those frowning irregularities I dislike so much, and such a placid eye and smile. And then, to my great relief, Mr. Henry Lynn summoned them to the other side of the room to settle some point about the deferred excursion to Hay Common. I was now able to concentrate my attention on the group by the fire, and I presently gathered that the newcomer was called Mr. Mason. Then I learned that he was but just arrived in England and that he had come from some hot country, which was the reason, doubtless, his face was so sallow and that he sat so near the hearth and wore a surtout in the house. Presently, the words Jamaica, Kingston, Spanish Town, indicated the West Indies as his residence. And it was with no little surprise that I gathered ere long that he had first seen and become acquainted with Mr. Rochester there. He spoke of his friend's dislike of the burning heats, the hurricanes, and the rainy seasons of that region. I knew Mr. Rochester had been a traveler. Mrs. Fairfax had said so. But I thought the continent of Europe had bounded his wanderings. Till now, I had never heard a hint given of his visits to more distant shores. I was pondering these things when an incident, and a somewhat unexpected one, broke the thread of my musings. Mr. Mason, shivering as someone chanced to open the door, asked for more coal to be put on the fire, which had burnt out its flame, though its massive cinder still shone hot and red. The footman who brought the coal in going out stopped near Mr. Ashton's chair and said something to him in a low voice, of which I heard only the words, old woman, quite troublesome. Tell her she shall be put in the stocks if she does not take herself off, replied the magistrate. No, stop, interrupted Colonel Dent. Don't send her away, Ashton. We might turn the thing to account. Better consult the ladies. And speaking aloud, he continued, ladies, you talked of going to Hay Common to visit the gypsy camp. Sam here says that one of the old mother bunches is in the servant's hall at this moment and insists upon being brought in before the quality to tell them their fortunes. Would you like to see her? Surely, Colonel, cried Lady Ingram, you would not encourage such a low impostor. Dismiss her by all means at once. But I cannot persuade her to go away, my lady, said the footman, nor can any of the servants. Mrs. Fairfax is just with her now, entreating her to be gone. But she has taken a chair in the chimney corner and says nothing shall stir her from it till she gets leave to come here. What does she want? asked Mrs. Ashton. To tell the gentry their fortune, she says, ma'am, and she swears she must and will do it. What is she like? inquired the Mrs. Ashton in a breath. A shockingly ugly old creature, miss, almost as black as a crock. Why, she's a real sorceress, cried Frederick Lynn. Let us have her in, of course. To be sure, rejoined his brother. It would be a thousand pities to throw away such a chance of fun. My dear boys, what are you thinking about? exclaimed Mrs. Lynn. I cannot possibly countenance any such inconsistent proceeding, chimed in the dowager Ingram. Indeed, Mamma, but you can and will, pronounced the haughty voice of Blanche as she turned round on the piano stool, where till now she had sat silent, apparently examining sundry sheets of music. I have a curiosity to hear my fortune told. Therefore, Sam, order the beldame forward. My darling Blanche, recollect, I do, I recollect all you can suggest, and I must have my will. Quick, Sam. Yes, 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 cried all the juveniles, both ladies and gentlemen. Let her come, it will be excellent sport. The footman still lingered. She looks a rough one, said he. Go, ejaculated Miss Ingram, and the man went. Excitement instantly seized the whole party. A running fire of raillery and jests was proceeding when Sam returned. She won't come now, said he. She says it's not her mission to appear before the vulgar herd, them's her words. I must show her into a room by herself, and then those who wish to consult her must go to her one by one. You see now, my queenly Blanche, began Lady Ingram, she encroaches, be advised, my angel girl, and... Show her into the library, of course, cut in the angel girl. It is not my mission to listen to her before the vulgar herd either. I mean to have her all to myself. Is there a fire in the library? Yes, ma'am, but she looks such a tinkler. 
cease that chatter, blockhead, and do my bidding. Again, Sam vanished, and mystery, animation, expectation rose to full flow once more. She's ready now, said the footman as he reappeared. She wishes to know who will be her first visitor. I think I had better just look in upon her before any of the ladies go, said Colonel Dent. Tell her, Sam, a gentleman is coming. Sam went and returned. She says, sir, that she'll have no gentleman. They need not trouble themselves to come near her, nor, he added with difficulty, suppressing a titter, any ladies either, except the young and single. By Jove, she has taste, exclaimed Henry Lynn. Miss Ingram rose solemnly. I go first, she said, in a tone which might have befitted the leader of a forlorn hope, mounting a breach in the van of his men. Oh, my best, oh, my dearest, pause, reflect, was her mamma's cry. But she swept past her in stately silence, passed through the door, which Colonel Dent held open, and we heard her enter the library. A comparative silence ensued. Lady Ingram wrung her hands. Miss Mary declared she felt for her part she never dared venture. Amy and Louisa Eshton tittered under their breath and looked a little frightened. The minutes passed very slowly. Fifteen were counted before the library door again opened. Miss Ingram returned to us through the arch. Would she laugh? Would she take it as a joke? All eyes met her with a glance of eager curiosity and she met all eyes with one of her buff and coldness. She looked neither flurried nor merry. She walked stiffly to her seat and took it in silence. Well, Blanche, said Lord Ingram. What did she say, sister? asked Mary. What did you think? How do you feel? Is she a real fortune teller? demanded the Mrs. Eshton. Now, now, good people, returned Miss Ingram. Don't press upon me. Really, your organs of wonder and credulity are easily excited. You seem, by the importance you all, my good mamma included, ascribe to this matter absolutely to believe we have a genuine witch in the house who is in close alliance with the old gentleman. I have seen a gypsy vagabond. She has practiced in hackneyed fashion the science of palmistry and told me what such people usually tell. My whim is gratified, and now I think Mr. Eshton will do well to put the hag in the stocks tomorrow morning, as he threatened." Miss Ingram took a book, leant back in her chair, and so declined further conversation. I watched her for nearly half an hour. During all that time, she never turned a page. And her face grew momentarily darker, more dissatisfied, and more sourly expressive of disappointment. She had obviously not heard anything to her advantage, and it seemed to me from her prolonged fit of gloom and taciturnity that she herself, notwithstanding her professed indifference, attached undue importance to whatever revelations had been made to her. Meantime, Mary Ingram, Amy, and Louisa Eshton declared they dared not go alone, and yet they all wished to go. A negotiation was opened through the medium of the ambassador, Sam, and after much pacing to and fro, till, I think, the said Sam's calves must have ached with exercise, permission was at last, with great difficulty, extorted from the rigorous Sybil, for the three to wait upon her in a body. Their visit was not so still as Miss Ingram's had been. We heard hysterical giggling and little shrieks proceeding from the library. And at the end of about 20 minutes, they burst the door open and came running across the hall as if they were half scared out of their wits. I'm sure she is something not right, they cried one and all. She told us such things. She knows all about us and they sank breathless into the various seats the gentlemen hastened to bring them. Pressed for further information, they declared she had told them of things they had said and done when they were mere children, described books and ornaments they had in their boudoirs at home, keepsakes that different relations had presented to them. They affirmed that she had even divined their thoughts and had whispered in the ear of each the name of the person she liked best in the world and informed them of what they most wished for. Here the gentlemen interposed with earnest petitions to be further enlightened on these last two named points, but they got only blushes, ejaculations, tremors, and titters in return for their importunity. The matrons, meantime, wielded fans and again and again reiterated the expression of their concern that their warning had not been taken in time, and the elder gentlemen laughed 
and the younger urged their services on the agitated fair ones. In the midst of the tumult, and while my eyes and ears were fully engaged in the scene before me, I heard a hem close at my elbow. I turned and saw Sam. If you please, miss, the gypsy declares that there is another young single lady in the room who has not been to see her yet, and she swears she will not go until she has seen all. I thought it must be you. There is no one else for it. What shall I tell her? Oh, I will go by all means, I answered, and I was glad of the unexpected opportunity to gratify my much excited curiosity. I slipped out of the room unobserved by any eye, for the company were gathered in one mass about the trembling trio who had just returned, and I closed the door quietly behind me. If you like, miss, said Sam, I'll wait in the hall for you, and if she frightens you, just call and I'll come in. No, Sam, return to the kitchen. I am not in the least afraid, nor was I, but I was a good deal interested and excited. So that brings us to the end of the chapter. Chapter 19 will kick off with Jane talking with the gypsy and getting her fortune told. It's a great scene. It's one of my favorites. I hope you'll be with me Monday at noon as we go into that scene and see what Jane learns from the gypsy. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Stay safe and I'll see you next time.